Welcome to Off Hours, a conversation between John Edwards and Chris Manning. A bit of follow-up from our threading episode. One of the things I discussed was the precursor to the lead screw on a lathe for cutting threads accurately. And that was using a thread follower. And in that episode, I said that the thread follower was attached to the tool and it isn't. That's that's how it's being used in a modern screw cutting lathe with a lead screw. The tool itself is what is what moves. Uh, in the case of the predecessor to it, the thread follower was actually attached to the headstock, and it would move the headstock back and forth. So, the uh, that that's something that a modern lathe shouldn't do. If your modern lathe does have a headstock that moves backwards and forwards, that's a problem, and you should get that fixed. Uh, but in earlier models, the thread follower was based on some of the ornamental engines that were out there, the ornamental lathes that were out there, and they had the ability to pump. They had a pumping action for the headstock, and so the the thread follower was based uh, partially on that. Anyway, so that was attached to the headstock, not the tool. And then a bit of follow-up from last week's episode about the SI units, specifically the meter. I had talked about the definition being redefined using the wavelength of light and that was the case at one point in the middle of the last century uh, however that's been changed instead of using a wavelength of light it has been changed to be based on the distance that light travels in a vacuum and it's it's just shy of 300 millionths of a second that distance so that's what now defines the meter since the speed of light in a vacuum shouldn't be changing anytime soon and I suspect our universe is in trouble if that constant changes for some reason because it's uh, that's a sort of a fundamental constant of the universe. So hopefully it doesn't change and hopefully the meter stays as it is. Uh, originally, the meter was defined as one ten millionth of the distance from the pole to the equator as it ran through Paris. And it's it's a little unfortunate they decided to choose that particular system for, for designing the original meter. Uh, there was one proposal before they decided on that that was going to base the meter on the length of a pendulum that had a period of one second. And I think that would have been absolutely beautiful. You know, it would have been a far more elegant solution than this ridiculous measuring of distances across, you know, long distances on the planet. But the, the length of the pendulum changes based on where you are on the planet as well, so... It throws, it throws some issues into things. Yeah, it's not. It's certainly not a perfect definition, but you could at least define the uh, gravity constant in the area that you're that you're working in. It's still not something that changes dramatically. Whereas the that distance between between pole and equator actually does change quite a bit. So anyway, it has been fixed now. It is now based on a second. We'll be discussing SI units a little bit more next week when we talk about the perfectionists. Uh, I've just about finished reading it. In fact, I'm in the chapter right now about SI units at the very end. And I know I have a lot to, to say about some of what he, he wrote about. And I'm sure you do as well. So we'll be uh, we'll be talking about the perfectionists on the next episode. So if you're if you want to follow along with the Off Hours Book Club, you can uh, you can find a copy of that wherever fine books are sold, and you can try and read it before the next episode. So I bought my first piece of art directly from an artist. Uh, this is kind of old hat for you. You've you've done this a number of times now. Yeah, like your house is a, a a bona fide gallery of original art pieces. Did you buy this from uh, a gallery, or did you actually meet the artist at uh, at some kind of an art showing? Oh, we actually met the artist. Uh, it's a Canadian artist who's based in Newfoundland. His name is Adam Young. He was in town for an exhibit this past weekend. I was showing off his work, and I, I couldn't quite afford the, the price tag on the original, but we did get uh, one of 50 prints uh, of this particular sure. piece that my, my wife was quite fond of. And he it was uh, very nice to chat with him, and he very graciously signed the the back of the canvas and, and wrote a little note to my my wife because this was a a piece that that she had had her eyes on for a, a couple months now since he had first completed it. It was a, a piece that he made this year. It's called the the Lighthouse Keeper's Daughter Number Two. The the first one he actually only sold the original of and did no prints of it, uh, but there was so much demand for prints that he just decided to do another one. 
Yeah, excellent. It is always nice to be able to meet the artists when you're uh, buying art. In fact, I, I don't know that I've ever purchased art where I didn't meet the artist originally. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know that uh, I don't know. There's any pieces that we have in our house that we haven't. Uh, in fact, in many cases, the uh, the artist is uh, is a good friend, uh, Stephen Strang, who we've spoken about before. I have a, a large collection of Strang, although uh, I'm told that I do not have the largest collection of original Strangs. I did at one point, but I don't anymore. So I need to maybe step up my uh, my purchasing of his uh, his art the next time I uh, he's doing a show. Well, your most recent acquisition is quite a handsome piece and. One of the larger strings that you've acquired, the memory thief, if memory serves me correctly. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's properly gargantuan for uh, for Steve's work. He uh, he tends to to do little pieces, sort of five by seven kind of sizes, and this one is uh, sixteen by sixteen, so it's it's quite large. We'll we'll put an image of the uh, of the painting up in the in the show notes. It certainly caught our attention and. Uh, I picked it up because I'm uh, I'm planning on putting it in my watchmaking studio when I finally finish working on that. And uh, I'm slowly collecting art that I want to put in there and use as inspiration. So I thought that this nice piece with a with an attractive pocket watch in it would be an appropriate item for my uh, my watch studio. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it probably fit a dozen or more of of Strang's paintings in the the span of the the canvas we just acquired it's, yeah. it's not the the biggest canvas that we have up on the wall this is the the first piece we we acquired directly from an artist and from an artist who's mm. still alive we've got a couple of other pieces around the house but they're all from artists who have long since passed on like Fragonard and and Casper Davis Friedrich and uh, artists like that but uh this is it's nice to be able to actually know who who painted uh, what's up on the wall and to have been able to, to shake his hand and, and hear him recount firsthand what what was behind it and what went into it. Absolutely. And and I know I, I've had a number of people ask me about about buying art because they come over to the house and they see that we have a we have a sizable collection of art. And uh, I will say that if you can buy buy art directly from the artist, it, it does make a big difference. If you're buying through a gallery, the gallery does take a significant percentage of the uh, of the sale. So if you can buy directly from the artist, I always recommend doing that. Also, you get the advantage of uh, speaking to the artist and meeting them, hopefully, and um, and being able to chat with them. And then they know as well that uh, that you're supporting them and, and you appreciate what they do. So that's always nice as well. Yeah, the other thing I'll say about art and collecting art, because people will talk about how much how much art is worth, and honestly, art is art is worth what you you know what you think it's going to be worth. It's it's not something that's worth buying assuming that it's going to go up in value uh, you have to you have to purchase it assuming that it it will be yours forever and that you will never resell it and that you have to enjoy it so if you don't enjoy a piece don't buy it it's not worth it regardless of how much it's worth or how much you think it may be worth one day don't uh, don't buy it based on that buy it based on the fact that you love the work and that you're interested in looking at it every uh, every day now yeah, go out there and find uh find in- interesting artists that are in your area because there, there's some stunning artwork out there and it, it is certainly worthwhile collecting mm-hmm. and strang's pieces have a, a nice whimsical quality to them mm. and uh, I, I find young's do as well though it's uh, in his his own way uh, they, they certainly differ the, the two of them but uh, it, was, it was nice to be able to see them all all first hand and he did have a couple of, of originals there too and being able to see the the brush strokes rising mm. up uh, away from that canvas as it's always a, a nice treat i really enjoy being able to, to take a, a close look at the brushwork anytime i'm, I'm visiting a, a gallery that has originals up on the the walls i wasn't familiar with his work before you mentioned him and i see the piece that uh, that you picked up on there and i like that it, i like his style i like the boldness of color that he's chosen and the uh, as well as as you said his sort of his whimsical style so yeah that's uh that's nice i like the uh, i like the work that he's doing yeah he's definitely done a good job of, of capturing some of that east coast charm now we we did chat a bit about uh, strang's work back on on episode nine we'll be sure to link to it again in, in the show notes for this episode uh, but a, another tidbit of information to refer back to from a, a previous episode that's worth worth touching on is the news that Printerbot is officially closed down. 
this is quite sudden. Back in episode 15, when we talked about 3D printers, I, I mentioned that the PrinterBot Play was the, the first 3D printer that I ever purchased. And uh, unfortunately, the company is no longer in business. Yeah, that is quite sudden. It's, it's unfortunate. They, um, there are a bunch of people out there I know who are looking for parts for that. So that's uh, that's unfortunate that all of a sudden they're they're disappeared. And I wonder if somebody's going to come in and fill fill that space with uh, replacement parts for their printers. But have you uh, mm. have you decided if you're going to try and uh, sort of struggle along with the printer bot you have, or are you going to replace it with something else? So I've gone ahead and uh, there was a, a sale on, on on some other printers this past weekend. So I I, I picked up another entry level printer uh, which i expect to be receiving in the the next couple of weeks and we'll see how it is uh, once i actually get it and get it set up oh, good. Uh, but i imagine the play would would still be able to run just fine for me for a good number of years and there are still some parts kicking around out there and uh i, I may hang on to it as a, a backup or more than likely sell it while it still has some value we'll see and as as far as someone coming up and, and filling the void that they've left this is something I've talked about with some other people this past week too. And then uh, one of them mentioned to me that uh, it's quite tough to, to manufacture something like that within the United States at, at the price they were selling it at and still be able to, to turn a profit and stay afloat. Uh, so I would imagine that uh, it's, it's not going to be leaving much of a, a vacuum to be filled by uh, another company who'd be operating out of the state uh, unfortunately yeah, it's unfortunate that we're losing uh mm-hmm. losing an inexpensive printer from the market but i'm sure that it will be filled quite quickly because that's there, there doesn't seem to be a, a lack of printers at the low end of the market right now mm-hmm. and you've been working with your printer quite a bit this past week too what do you what have you been up to there yeah i've been i've been struggling a little bit over the last couple of months i wasn't particularly happy with the accuracy that i was getting out of it accuracy in terms of dimensions one of the differences between the printer that you're using and, my, and the one I'm using is that mine is being driven by a UV projector. Think about uh, the same kind of projector that you would use for your computer, projecting it onto the wall, that kind of thing. Except in this case, instead of you know doing colored projection, it's just using UV light to cure the resin that's in the tank. And it's adjustable in terms of the uh, the focus point of that um, that projector. And so you have to sort of fiddle around with it a little bit and get the focus exactly right to to sort of get that down. And and I was having some I was struggling a little bit with getting that down properly. So I, I spent the day yesterday and, and part of today basically just going in and printing out some of my uh, my lugs and measuring the models that I was printing out and making sure that I was getting accurate prints. And so after a few test prints, I was able to sort of dial it in so that it's pretty close. It's it's within 0.3 millimeters of what I'm looking for. And that that's close enough, I think, for what I'm doing, because I'm, I'm probably going to get a little bit of shrinkage from my casting process as well, because the uh, the resin that I'm using. So it's a little bit oversized, a little bit of shrinkage in casting. I think it should work out pretty well. So we'll see what happens, and I should be casting the first versions of the lugs in the uh, the case next week in silver so hopefully that goes well and and hopefully i can take advantage of this printer for casting these lugs and or printing the lugs and then casting them nice it's good that you're able to to still be able to to salvage or work with the lugs despite being off by three tenths of a, a millimeter I, I had a terrible time well i shouldn't say terrible time I, it took me a few attempts this week to make a a, a particular part i, I was I was making for a a watch movement and uh i was off by 0.03 on my my first <laughs> attempt and and that just it wasn't gonna fly I yeah had to, yeah i had to make it again uh, one of the advantages of doing casework versus doing actual movement work is the the casework is is a little bit more forgiving and in this case i'll be milling slots into the center band of the watch to uh, to drop these lugs into and I won't be milling those slots until I have the actual f- cast piece mm-hmm. uh, from the from the 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 lugs, and then I can take the dimensions straight off of that instead of taking the ideal dimensions that I've modeled and and that I've uh, I've put in my drawings. 
So uh, there are advantages to to doing casework like this where you can machine the parts to the actual part that you have as opposed to just blindly needing to go on uh, exact dimensions that you're working to. So uh, that's mm -hmm. one of the one of the advantages of it. Yes, as Philippe Dufour is renowned for doing, he actually has the cases made before he even cuts the main plate for the movement that's going to be going sure. inside of the, the case because he'll cut the, the main plate to be a precise fit inside of the, the case the, down to the hundredth of a, a millimeter. Wow, well, that's that's interesting that he's chosen to go that way. I, I would have gone the other way, but I'm mostly because I think the, the case is a little bit more expendable in terms of the the dimensions so i i i'm a little surprised he's done that i would have probably cut the main plates and had those all all cut accurately and then take the case and do a final a final turn on that inside diameter to make sure that it fits properly but, hmm, that's interesting well unlike the approach that, you, that you're taking where you're you're using an off-the-shelf movement and then crafting the case Dufour's specialty is, is in the movement making side of things, and he actually has other sure. specialists that he relies on for making the cases and the, the dials and, and things like that for his watches. So he, he'll get a shipment of cases in from a case maker and then make the the movements bespoke to, to fit the actual case. Yeah, I guess if you're not doing any of the work on the case, it's easier to uh, it's easier to do it that way. You can rely mm -hmm. on, on them to have, have turned the the cases to at least a consistent accuracy amongst themselves and then uh, and then cut your main plates from there mm -hmm. this is one of the advantages of being able to do all of this yourself um, is that you can you can sort of pick and choose where you where you're fighting those battles and and uh, you don't have to rely on somebody else to to do that which is nice and an entirely different scale of, of cutting and precision while i was checking out uh, the art artistic works of, of paint on canvas this past weekend you were out walking the, the streets and observing the the work of a, an entirely different breed of of craftsmen what yeah. or what has you got up to this past weekend oh well, something i've been meaning to check out for a few years now is the canadian stone carving festival and this is something that i that came to my attention a number of years ago i started chatting with phil white online at one of the forums that i'm on and Phil White is the current Dominion sculptor. And the Dominion sculptor is the person responsible for the overseeing and directing and executing many of the stone carvings up on Parliament Hill. And this is a position that was created uh, probably 100 years ago uh, when they were rebuilding the Parliament buildings after a, a massive fire. And there was... Somebody realized that there was a need for sort of a an architect and a and a guiding hand uh, in carving the stone. And so when they were rebuilding it, uh, they had somebody who was sort of creating that vision of what the stone should look like. And they also made sure that there was a number of um, of blank spots left on the building where future artists could put their own work and and uh, sort of continue the the history of of Canada in stone. And so I, I found out about this this Canadian stone carving festival through Phil many years ago, and unfortunately, it's always been on a weekend when I've been out of town or I've been unavailable to go down. Uh, but they hold it down on Spark Street, which is one of our pedestrian malls in Ottawa, and they usually have anywhere from I think a dozen to twenty stone carvers uh, who come out. And the idea is that it's it starts on Friday morning, ends on Sunday afternoon, and they're each given a block of stone. Uh, it's Indiana limestone that they're given. And using nothing but hand tools, they have 18 hours to carve a design into the stone. So it was uh, it was kind of fun. We we got to check it out at the end near when uh, when everybody was finished. Uh, and it turns out that, that Tamarini, one of the artists that was there, he's a uh, calligrapher as well, so she knows him through the calligraphy world. And uh, yeah, we had a chance to see what, uh, what these these artists were doing. There were people there who had as little as six months worth of experience and others who had more than 40 years worth of experience doing it. Uh, and again, some of them were purely there for, uh, as a hobby, they were, you know, they were just doing it for fun. Uh, others are professionals. In fact, some of them were, were people who do work on a daily basis up on Parliament Hill doing restoration work and, and original carvings for uh, for the Parliament building. Yeah, it, was a, it was an interesting experience. Uh, it's, it's nice to see a different scale 
of art than what I do in a different permanence level than, uh, than some of the stuff that I do. Yeah. That sounds fascinating. I had no idea that that is an event that took place here in the capital, despite having lived very near Spark Street for a number of years. Yeah. We're quite fortunate in Ottawa because of the parliament buildings and because of the active restoration work, as well as the active new work that's being done uh, at, on the buildings. There is a huge community of, of stone carvers here in Ottawa, uh, comparatively. And in fact, I, I believe there's more stone carvers here in Ottawa than there are anywhere else in, in Canada, you know, just because of the active restoration work. Uh, I know this was a problem in the UK for a while. There was a, a huge demand for skilled carvers, skilled stone carvers, because many of them had, uh, had retired or died off. Uh, so I know there's been an active attempt to increase the, the number of uh, talented stone carvers or qualified stone carvers, I should say, in, uh, in the UK. It's nice to see such a thriving community here, and there, and there is certainly a thriving community, uh, including a school where you can learn to stone carve here in Ottawa. Over the years, I've sort of mused with the idea of, of trying my hand at stone carving, so who knows, maybe I'll Maybe I'll take a class and uh, and give it a chance. It's uh, certainly a different scale than what I'm used to working on, and it would be uh, I think it would be kind of fun. Mm -hmm. I, I tried my hand at it with a an air hammer in my youth, and couldn't really feel my limbs very well the next day. Uh, what <laughs> what sort of tools were they were they using? They were using purely hammer and chisel. Uh, there was no oh, wow. no power tools being used at all. It was all being done with hand tools. So yeah, that uh, and and files and sandpaper as well. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I, I'm not sure that I would want to do this with power tools. I, I like the idea of, it's certainly still not a quiet art doing it with hand mm -hmm. tools, but um, it, it doesn't have the uh, the level of violence that uh, the power tools have when it comes to working on stone. So a number of them must have forearms like longbow archers. <laughs> well, I'm not sure the, the you know, you're, a lot of it shouldn't require a huge amount of strength to do. Uh, you should be able to do it with precision and and uh, a sharp tool as opposed to just just pure power, sort of like a mm. blacksmith, right? I, I, we have this idea in our minds of a blacksmith who has massive arms, but if a blacksmith is working smart, they shouldn't necessarily need to have huge, powerful arms when they're working. You should be able to work and and uh, without a huge amount of power. And I think the same the same goes for stone carving. If you're, I think if you're trying to overpower the stone, you're probably going to fail at, at a lot of it and probably hurt yourself. The most blacksmiths I, I know of today who are working in, in a, any real professional capacity tend to use pneumatic hammers too, which uh, definitely makes the job a lot easier. Yeah, certainly, and and that's being done mostly for for speed. It's uh, and also because the you know as I've discussed in in my own work, getting apprentices is something that's very difficult to do nowadays. Uh, so the the power hammer basically takes the place of the apprentice, and uh, mm. you know, so for some of the for some of the forge welding techniques and and the larger structural pieces, you you do need to use something a bit bigger. But yeah, it's it's mostly for speed and to to replace uh, unskilled labor, as it were. Now, a couple of shows ago, I was uh, razzing you a little bit about <laughs> your your Apple Watch and the fact that you were building a, a more anachronistic watch of of your own and and how how you could possibly resolve this is within your own mind and sort of the men mental gymnastics you, you'd be going through to mm. to justify making a mechanical watch while, while still sporting the Apple Watch. And uh, a, a very ardent uh, Apple Watch wearer uh, who you've alluded to, I think we, we've talked about in, in previous episodes uh, from Cortex, is uh, Mike Hurley. And uh, it, interestingly enough, shortly after... The, that episode aired where where I was razzing you a bit. He ad admitted to uh, having taken his Apple Watch off his wrist and and supplanted it with a Nomos for uh, quite a number of months now. Yeah, and I just thought there were a lot of interesting parallels there between uh, what we had discussed and what Mike and, and CGP Gray discussed uh, as well. And I agreed with uh, pretty much everything the the two of them said and hashed out. And there's certainly a balance to be had there, but. It's Wondering what what your thoughts were on that uh, when you caught that episode. Yeah, it was it was funny listening to Mike talk about that so so soon after we had discussed it, and and he had given up his uh, he had abandoned his Apple Watch uh, earlier than than I have. Although to be fair, I, I've been wearing a watch most of my life uh, of some kind, and obviously most of that time has not been an Apple Watch. Uh, and in fact, the majority of the time, it's been a it's been a various mechanical watches. So 
um, wearing a mechanical watch is certainly not something new for me when I do go back to wearing one. Uh, this, the, uh, the Apple watch is, is, uh, is still probably going to be a blip on the radar in terms of the amount of time that I spend with a watch on my hand or on my, uh, on my wrist. But yes, with, with Mike, I, I agree with a lot of what he said to say. Um, I agreed a lot with his struggles of, of changing his notifications from his watch to his phone. He, he had done the, the same thing that I had done where he had moved nearly all of his notifications off of his phone and onto his watch. So only the important things ended up going to his watch. And it certainly meant that he was looking at his phone less often. And that's something that I, I found. And when he started using a mechanical watch solely, he was having a, a little bit of, of sort of shock in terms of going back to the notifications on his phone and how often he was looking at it. So yeah, it was a, it was an interesting discussion and uh, it was, it was nice to listen to somebody else who's sort of going through the same, the same struggles as I am in terms of deciding which way to go. Uh, and he is still planning on using it for, fitness tracking which is something that i intend to do as well and uh i i may i may still double watch it we'll see i'm mm -hmm. not sure may put my apple watch on my right wrist and a mechanical watch on my left wrist we'll see how that goes uh, it would be nice if the the apple watch was a little bit thinner than than it is now to be able to do that i think it's a little bit awkward now with uh be doing two watches not the size that it is but it, if, it's certainly a worthwhile episode to listen to in terms of of how Somebody who is enjoying the mechanical side of things is also, you know, interested in the tech side of things as well. And he said that he hasn't, you know, sworn off of the Apple Watch completely. He may still come back to it. And I suspect he probably will when anyone comes out. He'll at the very least experiment with it and see if it's something that he wants to uh, to use. And I, I suspect I will probably do the same thing. And I will probably have the Apple Watch as something that, that I sort of wear semi-regularly as opposed to all the time now. Yeah, I found it interesting that the, the one big use case that you both really wouldn't be able to, to part with the Apple Watch for was actually swimming links in the pool. And that seems to be the, the the one activity that it has really served a, a big use case for in both your lives. Yeah, I, I I know a number of people who have things like Fitbits or equivalent fitness trackers, and I, I've looked into them, but I've, I've never been particularly impressed with their ability to, to track what you're doing. The Apple Watch just has so many advantages in terms of its computing power, the sensors that are built into it, and then probably the most important thing, its tight integration into iOS and your phone. So it's something that I use regularly when I'm at the gym, when I'm working out, whether it's running, cycling, swimming, doesn't matter what it is, I'm regularly using my Apple Watch for that. Uh, the other thing that uh, that he mentioned that uh, that was painful that he was that that he was noticing without it was using Apple Pay, mm. and I, I tend to use Apple Pay off my phone more than my watch while I'm here in Ottawa, and while I'm you know most stores I tend to use my my phone versus my watch, uh, but his use case that he was missing was using the Apple Pay uh, from his watch in the London Underground. It is so nice to be able to just walk up to a turnstile double click the button on your watch you don't even have to look at it you just have to put your wrist down on them on the sensor as you're walking through beep you know it it tags your phone or it tags your your card and then when you leave again it's the same thing just tap your watch on them on the um the carousel as you're going out and you don't have to deal with it you don't have to deal with a card you don't have to deal with anything um so i i would certainly miss that and i i think i don't know if i've mentioned it before on on this show but um, I, I've certainly mentioned it to, to friends before. I still think the Apple Watch is probably the most significant travel gadget I have mm. ever used. Like it's it's been the most beneficial travel gadget I've ever used. When you're in a city that you don't know, the ability to send directions to your watch and have it tap your wrist to tell you which way to turn as you're walking around a city mm -hmm. is so revolutionary and and uh, eye-opening absolutely it allows you the freedom to wander a little bit off of the beaten path you're not sitting there staring at your phone or a map or whatever as you're walking around you know you get to sort of experience the city a little bit more and be able to see and enjoy the city quite a bit more as you're walking around uh, i know when i walked around kyoto with it or tokyo or even london somewhere like that if it's a place that you don't know very well being able to say i want to get to this destination point being able to just sort of take a left turn because that street looks interesting is is so liberating when you're when you're walking around so i suspect that 
even with a mechanical watch that I build, when I travel, I'm probably going to keep my, my Apple Watch handy. Everything from directions to Apple Pay to um, even notifications about airlines. When you're flying, gate changes happen regularly or there mm-hmm. might be delays in a plane or whatever. Having those notifications go straight to your watch is, is certainly advantageous. There, there are still benefits to having it, and I, I would be surprised if I ever get rid of an Apple Watch completely. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's it's use will certainly be curtailed by having a, a nice mechanical watch again. Yeah, I can certainly see both sides of the coin. And one thing I, I admire about what Mike said as well is this, that he admits like this is where he's he's currently at. This is current Mike is enjoying wearing his Nomos, and that may change in the future. We are always changing and adapting, and our our tastes and our our priorities change over time. And uh, right now, this is this is where he's at, and he's, he's enjoying wearing the Nomos, throwing the Apple Watch on when he goes in the pool, and uh, just kind of juggling things that way. I've never understood people who categorically say that they they refuse to ever try using something like an Apple Watch. There again, there mm-hmm. are benefits to it, and there are benef- certainly benefits to wearing it all the time. I mean, Apple has certainly designed it in such a way that that there is a benefit to having it on your wrist all the time. If you're if you're interested in sort of tracking your your life and, and tracking what you're doing. Uh, there, there certainly are benefits to that. And also not just from a tracking point of view, but from a notification point of view and integration, control over music and podcasts and things like that off your phone. Uh, there are huge benefits to doing that all the, wearing it all the time, but certainly there is a benefit to having it around. You know, it, it's certainly worth trying for, for most people, whether you do wear a mechanical watch all, you know, most of the time or not. Uh, there certainly are use cases where having a, a an Apple Watch having some sort of a connected device on your wrist is beneficial. And I think until we have a better wearable device, you know, again, something like glasses or something like that, which which give you a better interface to seeing the world and, and interacting with the world through through your phone, I think the, the watch is still the, the best sort of option. In fact, in a lot of ways, I would probably give up my phone uh, if the watch was a little bit more reliable and, and had some you know, some of these sort of expanded features and and expanded performance. The larger device of the the phone actually drives me nuts, and I, I think that the I think that having something a little bit smaller would be would be beneficial. Interesting. Unpack that for me. What what are some of the the key features the the watch would need to adopt for you to be able to feel comfortable leaving your your phone behind? I think a slightly better interface in terms of reading what's going on. Um, I think that. When it comes to notifications and stuff like that, uh, the what you're seeing on screen is often a little bit too limited. Uh, you're not getting quite as much as you get on a notification of the on the lock screen, for instance, in many cases. So I, I would want to see a little bit more of that. Also, the ability to reply to notifications from the the watch is limited, mostly because the applications aren't running directly on the watch. So, for instance, if if there was something like Tweetbot or or Facebook Messenger or something like that, or uh, well, iMessage it is running. You know, you can get it straight on the watch. But um, many of these other these other apps where I would be using it for, uh, you know, for receiving notifications or maybe replying to something or seeing something like a calendar event or something like that, uh, or maybe finding a destination that I'm I'm trying to get to through Maps. Those are those are all still pretty limited right now, primarily due to storage constraints on the, the device, uh, processor constraints, and mostly due to the, uh, the thermal envelope of the device, the, the CPU can't really run uh, as fast as, as it, you know, they would like it to. And of course, the faster the CPU is running, the, the harder that is on the battery. So there are a lot of limitations of it right now. It's still pretty early on in the, the development of the, of the device. But I think as, as we start to see faster processors in there, as we see more storage in there, uh, it already has LTE capability now, so it has always-on connectivity to the internet. Uh, that that's one of the key things that it was missing. So I think as we start to see more applications running directly on the the watch itself, it will become something that could actually replace the uh, you know the the phone. Because to be honest, most of the time, the things that I'm I'm interested in on my phone uh, are you know I'm reading something like. Uh, like Twitter or you know Instagram or something like that, and I don't necessarily need to do that on a phone. In fact, most cases I would much rather be doing it on an iPad on a on a larger screen than what my phone does. But that phone is still pretty large, and I still have to carry it in my pocket, and it's still awkward, and it 
you know, I would still much rather have something smaller that's uh, that's a little bit less awkward to uh, to carry around. Mm. Now, while I agreed with pretty much everything that Gray and, and Mike had to say uh, con- concerning uh, his his move to the the Nomos from the the Apple Watch, uh, one area that uh, I I am not in agreement on is the the way he's handling the notifications from the phone and not having mm. any sort of custom tap tones or or ringtones set up for the various alerts because that's something that uh, i find incredibly beneficial um, yeah. on the phone is having custom alerts and so i have custom text tones set up for my wife and for friends and, and family so if a particular buzz goes off in my, my pocket i know whether it's something i want to address right away or it's whether it's something that is just a, a generic text i happen to have gotten from something that, that isn't a priority so not something i need to to drop what i'm doing and, and pull my phone out to check out and it's just really changed the way that i interact with my device ever since i i set those up uh, a few years ago yeah i agree completely the, the custom notifications are a total game changer if you are relying on your phone as your primary source of notification there are so many notifications coming into our devices and if you have no way of being able to distinguish between them it, it can be frustrating and and you certainly would be looking at your phone a lot more than you need to uh, i know i mentioned before the one of the biggest advantages for me of going to the apple watch is the fact that i can put critical notifications to my watch instead of having them go only to my phone. I know that if my phone buzzes and my watch doesn't, I know that it's not a particularly important message or a particularly important notification, so I can I can ignore it if I'm in the middle of doing something else. Uh, so, for instance, if I'm if I'm having lunch with somebody or I'm having dinner with somebody or whatever, and and my watch buzzes, I, I at least look at it to see if it's something that I have to take care of right away. If my phone buzzes and I'm at dinner, I completely ignore it. There is nothing that's that's uh, going to buzz my phone during dinner but not my watch that i need to care about so yeah the the way of getting around that is custom notifications and i I think that's a that's something that if if you struggle with your notifications right now if you find yourself either frustrated with the number of notifications you're getting that you look at that you don't necessarily need to look at or you know you're just sort of overwhelmed with them or you don't you want to be able to distinguish them better the the custom tapping the custom buzzing is is definitely something that you need to you need to look at yeah it makes a huge difference in in quality of life and there are, are physiological effects to every time your your phone dings or or buzzes uh, you actually have a a hormonal response to that and it'll light up your adrenal gland and being able to to know exactly what that alert is or, or curtailing alerts down to a minimum. I have very few alerts that actually will come through on my phone and, and notify me. And I have a, quite a few that just flat out ignored. Uh, there's an, an interesting documentary episode from uh, the BBC Panorama that we'll link to in the, sh- the show notes too that actually shows someone, the, the actual the, the reporter who, who was working on the, the documentary or the, the expose, I guess you could say, about smartphones, they actually hooked her up to uh, a machine and had her focus on a, a particular activity, and they had taken her phone away and set it just behind her. And without telling her, one of the people running the experiment w- was texting her in the background, and then afterwards they showed her the, the graph of her mm. cortisol levels basically spiking every time the, the phone buzzed. Interesting. And that uh, the, the actual anxiety yeah. uh, I- inducing effect that that it had and just how much it peaked by the end of the the exercise that she was engaging in it was uh eye-opening yeah i know years ago when i was in the it industry doing on-call work regularly uh, i i I was in a job at one point where i was on call every second week and we were getting active calls on a regular basis and after i left that job it took nearly nine months for me to stop waking up in the middle of the night not you know freaking out that I hadn't mm. heard my phone. You know, I had thought, oh, my you know, like my brain was sitting there saying, okay, you haven't heard a you know, you haven't heard a page. What's wrong? Why haven't you heard a page? Did you miss it? And uh yeah, it took it took nearly 9 months for me to stop waking up like that and uh and stop reacting to the lack of something. Uh I'd also regularly get phantom buzzes on my uh on my hip where I used to carry my pager, so it's uh it's amazing how quickly your brain adapts to that kind of thing and how it reacts to it. So 
obviously reducing notifications is something that's important if you can. And I think that that leads into uh, some of this, some of the things that ha- are, is happening in iOS 12. Uh, and I know this is something that Mike and Gray talked a little bit about in the show because they've both been running the beta of iOS 12. And I've been running the beta on both my my carry phone and my iPad over the last uh, the last month or so. I'm on the public beta, and some of the new features that are available in in terms of notifications on iOS 12 have, are certainly going to make this easier. Uh, everything from the ability to to change how a notification works the instant it comes in. So if you see a notification come up from Facebook, you can click on it and change the way that all notifications from Facebook react. You don't have to go into settings now to go and dig through and find the settings, you know, in particular for Facebook and try and figure it out. So you can say, deliver this quietly from now on. And you don't ever have to deal with, you know, with notifications from Facebook buzzing you or whatever. So the, there are a few things like that, that in iOS 12 that I'm, I'm finding are really pleasant for how you deal with notifications and, and certainly a huge improvement over, over previous versions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely a, a big improvement there. It makes it much simpler for just about anyone to be able to better manage and, and toggle the way that notifications are, are handled on the phone. And it offers a finer grain of control too, which is nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, I think so, so one of the features that people should really look at if they're if they're on iOS and they're getting into uh, once once iOS twelve becomes uh, publicly available, I don't recommend that you get the beta. Uh, but come the end of September, when the the full release comes out, the GA release comes out, uh, one of the features that's really nice is the ability to turn on Do Not Disturb, you know, based on and have it end based on different criteria. So I have a Do Not Disturb set up, and this is something I had in iOS 11. If you go into your clock app and you look at the bedtime option, you can have Do Not Disturb automatically come on at a certain time and automatically turn off at a different time. Uh, which is nice. It, that's a that's a nice feature. So you know that you're not going to get notifications in the middle of the night. Uh, but now you have the option to say, "Do not disturb until the end of this calendar event." So if you're, you know, if you've got, for instance, you're recording a podcast and you have that podcast in your calendar, then you can say, "Don't disturb me until the end of this calendar event," or if it's a meeting that you're in or whatever then it won't disturb you. You won't get any notifications at all until that calendar event finishes. Uh, you can also set it up based on where you're located. So for instance, if you're out at dinner, you can say, do not disturb until I leave this location. And so it doesn't matter how long dinner is, until you leave that location, you won't start getting any notifications. So s- certain things like that are really nice. Uh, the, the do not disturb feature I know is one that a lot of people have have avoided using because they didn't necessarily know whether they had do not disturb turned on and they had turned it on and they had forgotten to turn it off, you know, and so they, were, they weren't they were getting notifications when they wanted to. That's certainly been improved a lot, and it's worthwhile experimenting with in the new version just because it is it is a lot more powerful than it used to be and uh, certainly has some advantages over the, the previous versions. And just to wrap up, I think it's worth touching on how to set up the custom per contact ringtones and, and text tones for anyone who does want to do that because it's... Uh... Not necessarily the most obvious thing, but if you just drop into the the contacts app and then uh, hit the the edit button on the the contact you want to add a, a custom tone for, uh, we'll actually do this live. So if you want to walk along with me, you can do the same thing. You just drop in and say I want to set a, a custom text tone for someone. You can go in and and pick from all the various audible tones that there are there, but you can also set custom vibration tone by hitting vibration. And they have a, a bunch that are already set up, but then you can also create your own vibration. And then by tapping on the screen in, in any pattern or frequency that you like, you can actually create a, your very own custom tap tone that you would receive for a particular contact, whether they happen to be calling you or, or sending you a message. And I found that really just, just changed the way that I interact with my device when it's in my pocket. Definitely worth worth optimizing at least a few contacts for yeah absolutely i, I think the, the last thing i want to talk about with with ios 12 and i have there's a few a few new features that are that are in there in terms of being able to monitor how much time you're spending on your device uh, specifically screen time and this is a, a great new feature where it tells you how many hours a week you're using particular applications how many times you're picking up your phone every day 
Uh, you're also seeing things about how many notifications you're getting. So I, it's telling me that across my phone and my iPad, um, Kindle, Tweetbot, and Instagram are the three most used apps that I have, which isn't surprising. I'm getting most of my notifications for my message, and you know, and it's telling me how often that I'm picking up my my device. So those are all useful things if you're if you're interested in sort of how much you're actually using your device and how much it's affecting you. That that can give you some good insight into what's going on. And, and if you're interested in trying to curtail the use of certain things, you can also use um, a setting called downtime to change the amount of time that's available for an app during the day. So, for instance, you can say all right, I want to be able to use Facebook for only one hour a day. And so it will keep track of how often you're using Facebook. And once you've used Facebook for an hour that day, it will then come up and say, sorry, but you've used Facebook for more than your allotted time. You know, if you, uh, you know, if you want to bypass this, there's a button that you can use to bypass it for 15 minutes. But if you, if you don't click on that button, then you won't be able to use Facebook again until the next day. So, and you won't be getting any notifications from Facebook in that case. It's almost as if the app has been uninstalled off your phone. So I, I think downtime is something that, that will be useful for a lot of people in terms of being able to control how much they're using certain apps if they're if they're finding they spend too much time in, in certain places. And if you're an, a parent trying to keep track of your kid's use of, the, uh, of an iOS device, then there's ways of setting that up as a parent so that you can control how much time they have. So you can say that they have unlimited access to education and reading apps but they only have an hour a day in games and so you can control it based on on a category as well you don't have to necessarily specify per application how much time they've got so yeah there there are a few few features in there that i think are going to be good for people's well-being and health when it comes to how they they interact with their phones between the notifications and and uh, do not disturb and screen time i think it's i think they're going to be ways of of people being able to to have a healthier relationship with their phone which is uh, which is always good mm. well thanks for listening everybody the show notes for this episode will be up at offhours.show slash ep22 and you can always feel free to send us a, an email or use the contact form on the site to send along any, any questions or feedback that you have to hello at offhours.show and we'll see you again in two weeks Thanks for listening to Off Hours. You can find detailed show notes at offhours.show. If you'd like to keep up to date with the show, follow us on Twitter at Off Hours. John can be found on Twitter at Under the Loop, and Chris can be found on Twitter and Instagram at Silver underscore Hand.